as we find ourselves preparing for our next exam, our minds often go back and think about the exams that came before. Because math has a way of sort of reusing ideas. And so if we can go and say, ah, I see how the ideas worked before, then maybe, more than maybe, we'll be able to see how the ideas work again. So let's do a nice fun exam. I have here a Math 265, you can also call this Calculus 3, Exam 1 from Fall 2022. It's going to be a fun exam, seven problems, plenty of chances for us to demonstrate our knowledge. And of course, the first thing we should do is, since we want to get credit for it, we should put our name. And so, well, we'll call ourselves Answers, and that's our goal. So, let's begin. Number one, find two values of c such that the vector c squared negative 3c plus 4 is perpendicular to the vector 1, 2c, 1. Now, how do we know these are vectors and not points? Well, for one thing, points can be perpendicular. But the other thing is we see those angled brackets there. And so when we see the angled brackets, that means points. Well, how do we know things are perpendicular? What's our test? Well, there's a, a simple way to tell if vectors are perpendicular, and that is you look at the dot product. If u dot v equals zero, that means that they're perpendicular. So we say, great. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these two vectors, take their dot product, set it equal to zero, and then say, well, what does that force on us? So we'll have c squared negative 3, c plus 4, dot 1 2 c 1 and if we take the dot product so that remember that just means multiply the corresponding entries and add so c squared times 1 is c squared minus 3 times 2 c minus 6 c and c plus 4 times 1 is c plus 4. well okay so that's c squared minus 5 c plus 4. And our goal, we want this to equal 0. Well, okay, quadratic. We could do the quadratic formula, but I wouldn't be surprised if when we tried to factor, it would factor. Our teachers like us, and teachers that like you, they give you things that factor. So, okay, what would we need? Well, we would need two things that multiply to 4, add to negative 5, and there are two things that do that, minus 1 and minus 4. All right, well, you can check. c squared, good. Minus 4c minus c makes minus 5c and plus 4. Well, that gives us either c equals 1 or c equals 4. And those are our two answers, right? They said two values, two answers, and done. Good. Well, that's a nice start. Well, you know, you always want to start off with an easier problem. And generally speaking, by the way, that is how they try to order problems. They like give you a good one, get the, the math genes, the math juices flowing. And uh, they, the, the ones at the end are the, the funner ones. All right, anyways, uh, part A. That was now part B. Find the value of number A such that the vector a 2 minus a 6 is parallel to minus 1 2 3. Now there actually is a way to do this uh, using something similar to dot product. You could say ah u cross v equals 0 but I would say that generally speaking this is a little bit hard because cross products they take work. We're going to do one. It's like a guarantee there's going to be a cross product somewhere on the exam. But a better way is to say, well, what's another way to test parallel? So we're parallel if we're moving in the same direction. And I, I put same in quotes because we could be moving in either you know, the same direction or exactly opposite directions. It's still considered parallel. More precisely, we say, look, it has to be the case that u is some multiple. Let's see, what letter can we use that we haven't used yet? 
uh, I'll say k. U is some multiple of b. So this is a little bit easier to work with. And so, well, that's the one I'll, I'll go with. Might as well. Okay, so I want a, 2 minus a, 6, is going to be some multiple k of minus 1, 2, 3. So, well, if you multiply that k in, that's minus k, 2k, 3k. Now, looking here, the vector, well, each entry has to match. So a has to equal negative k. 2 minus a has to equal 2k. 6 has to equal 3k. And then you're looking at that last one, 6 equals 3k. Well, wait a second, that's pretty easy. That tells us that k has to equal 2. And then you say, well, wait a second. a equals minus k, so then a has to equal minus 2, and you're done, right? Now you might say, well, what about this middle equation? Well, this has to be true, otherwise it's, there might not be any value of a. Now, is it true? 2 minus minus 2 is 2 plus 2, which is 4. does, in fact, equal 2 times 2, which is 4. And uh, so there you go. Well, that was good. A nice warm-up. And uh, all right, let's uh, keep moving along. Number two, match each quadric surface with its corresponding equation by putting the number equation next to the correct surface. Now, it's just a pure matching problem. There's, there's no, you know, you have to justify things. There's no show your work. It's kind of like you either get it right or you don't. And so uh, it's good to sort of say, okay, what are these shapes? And see if we can figure things out, because that helps a lot. Uh, so on this one, well, this is a, a cone. And we see things coming to a point and moving out. Now, the reason why it's a cone, if you, if you look, you can see that you see these straight lines flowing through here. Uh, this is an M&M. &M. Well, okay, no, that, that's not a name of a shape. This is an ellipsoid. And so, uh, basically, it's, it's sort of a three-dimensional version of an ellipse. Here, this uh, disconnected part, so if it's disconnected, it's a hyperboloid of two sheets. And here, well, it's uh, it kind of has this sort of this hourglass shape, but everything is connected. This one is a hyperboloid of one sheet. And uh, down here, well, it's it's like a bowl shape here, so we could call it a bowl, or if we were going to sound very fancy, we could call it a paraboloid. And uh, okay, so there's our 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 shapes that we're looking for. Now, how do we go about doing this? Well, uh, it helps to, to be familiar with the equations. So, for example, an ellipsoid looks like something x squared plus something y squared plus something z squared, where all the coefficients are positive. And uh, all that equals a, a 1. And we, we check, we say, well, hey, that's 4. This is an ellipsoid. And, uh, all right, is anything else an ellipsoid? And... Uh, you know, something x squared, something y squared, something z squared equals 1. And the answer is no. No. And so, okay, so, so that M&M, &M, easy to find. Now, a paraboloid, two of these things will be squared, and the third one will not be squared. And so we say, okay, well, do we have paraboloids? Well, we actually do. This is a paraboloid, right? The x squared and the y squared, and then just the z. So that's one, but this is also a paraboloid. And now we're like, oh, very suspicious here. But you might have noticed they gave us six equations and five picture. So it's like, ah, this is the subtle one. How do we distinguish? So we have to take a little bit and go just slightly more deep in this one. Now this paraboloid is opening in the z direction because it's something equals z. So in other words, it should be opening up. On this paraboloid, we, we should be opening in the y direction. So if, if we were trying to plot what this paraboloid should do, 
you have your x, y, and z, it would be a bowl opening sideways. This bowl opens up. So that says we need to be number five. We're number five there. All right. Well, uh, what else do we have? Now, the cone is something squared plus something squared equals something squared. So this, this is a cone. And uh, well, by process of elimination, you only have one cone. So that's number two. Another thing you can do, by the way, is if when in doubt, do cross sections. And that leaves us with two options left. One is a hyperboloid of two sheets. One is a hyperboloid of one sheet. And so you start to start thinking like, okay, uh, which one is which? Which is not always so clear. It, it can be a little bit subtle. And uh, so we start thinking like, okay, how can we figure this out? Well, uh, one way to, to figure this out is uh, suppose we take a look at our picture. Notice here that at y equals zero, we don't hit anything at all, right? It's just, imagine taking a slice, we completely miss it. Now, between these two, which one has that behavior? When we put y equals zero here, we get minus something squared and a minus something squared equals a plus one. Hopeless, hopeless. So this one completely misses y equals zero. Over here, we get minus x squared plus two z squared equals two, which says, oh, if you were to slice at zero, you'd see a hyperbola. So you do actually hit something. So that means, okay, so this better be three. And so this needs to be the last option, which is six. And in fact, the hyperboloids, what happens is you can tell you're in hyperboloid if you have two out of three are one sign and then the last one is the other. Though in particular, if, okay, so let's compare ellipsoid versus paraboloid, sorry, hyperboloids. So ellipsoid, all positive equals one. Hyperboloid of two sheets You'll have two negative and one positive equals one. Hyperboloid of one sheet, you'll have two positive and one negative equals one. So you get to have divided both sides by two. So, but anyways, the answer is two, four, three, six, five. Now, of course, a lot of this comes down to how comfortable are you with things. So my advice is when in doubt, use cross sections. And you might say, well, which cross cross sections should you use and uh, I would recommend not being fancy just do the following namely what happens when you plug in x equals zero what happens when you plug in y equals zero what happens when you plug in z equals zero so for instance here when you plug in x or y or z you'll see that each slice you get ellipses so you would say oh I see an ellipse I see an ellipse I see an ellipse, like, oh, that, that should look kind of like an M and M. And, uh, well, if you plug in Y equals zero in this first, uh, first one, well, you get the X squared plus three Z squared equals zero. So it's like, okay, you get the point zero, zero. Well, if you plug in X equals zero, you, you get, oh, it, it's a parabola. If you plug in Z equals zero, it's a parabola and so forth and so on. And so you can build up from cross sections and get enough information. So if you don't know what to do, use the cross sections, x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero, and that's it. You can figure everything out if you know what's happening in those three cross sections. So, okay, all right. Well, uh, that's it. Two, four, three, six, five. All right, well, it's fun, fun to have picture problems, isn't it? Yeah. In, in count three, perfect subject for it. All right, let's keep going. Number three, a solid is formed by intersecting the following regions, which are given in spherical coordinates. So region one, zero is less than or equal to rho cosine phi. Okay, uh, region two, rho cosine phi 
is less than or equal to 2 rho sine phi. Region 3, rho sine phi is less than or equal to 1. All right, part A. Rewrite the inequalities in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, now, if you're a young person, these will be very fresh in your mind. If you're an old person like me, you may have to think about it for just a second. So I just want to remind myself how everything works. So what happens is if I have a point here, so here's my point in space, then I have three things to describe. Now notice the three things, there's only two things showing up, row and phi. So theta says, how do I spin about the axis for the z-axis? That's theta. So since there's no theta, everything is rotationally symmetric. So it's like you spun it around. Rho is how far out you go from the origin to your point. Phi is how far off you come. Now, here's some very fun facts. So if I look at this distance, it's the same as this distance down here, which is our r. And, uh, and then this distance, of course, is our z. Now, if I look at my triangles, I say, well, what do I see? So I'm going to draw my triangle over here. I see my angle phi. I see opposite that is r, adjacent to that is z, and hypotenuse is rho. And now I think about my trig functions. Cosine works with adjacent, so cosine of phi is z over rho, or we could say z is rho cosine phi. And then if you do the same thing for sine, sine of phi is equal to r over rho, or if you like, rho equals r sine phi. Okay, so here we go. Rewrite the inequalities in cylindrical coordinates. Well, cylindrical coordinates are going to use theta, z, and r. So if I see a rho cosine phi, that becomes a z. So we say, oh, 0 is less than or equal to z. Another way to say that is z is greater than or equal to 0. So we are above the xy plane. That wasn't too bad. The next region, rho cosine phi, well, that's again z is less than or equal to 2 rho sine phi, which is 2r. And then we have rho sine phi, and rho sine phi, uh, whoops, I made a mistake here. I'm going to copy, right. I should have said r equals rho sine phi. I can't believe I made it. Well, that's all right. That's why you double check yourself, right? It's, it's a good thing to do. So rho sine phi is r, so r is less than or equal to 1. And there are our inequalities using only z, r, and theta. Of course, there is no theta involved. Again, that just means it's rotationally uh, going to be fine. So looking ahead for part b is find the volume of the solid, and it says there's a hint, the volume of a sphere is something, the volume of a cone is something, and the volume of a cylinder is something. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, uh, we'll worry about those when we understand our, our region. So let's, uh, we have some space here. Let's build up these inequalities and see what's happening. So the fact that z is greater than or equal to zero says, okay, I need to be above the xy plane. So I'm I'm everywhere above the x-y plane. All right. Okay, so I'm upstairs. All right, well, that's not too surprising. Uh, let's jump ahead to the last one, r less than or equal to 1. Now, just r equals 1 would be a circle in the x-y plane. There's no z, so that becomes a cylinder. So that says, okay, we're inside the cylinder. All right, so... We know we are above the plane, 
and we are in the cylinder. Okay, so we have those two things. And then we have this last one, which says z is less than or equal to 2r. Okay, so how do we handle that? Now here's what I recommend. I work in what I call the rz plane. Now I know r only goes to one, and, uh, okay, z is less than or equal to 2r, so I imagine there's this line going up, which of course, whoops, should move it further up. I hit that two. So, for example, when I, I have at uh, r equals one, z is less than or equal to two. So, what's going on is if z is less than or equal to two r, but of course z is greater than or equal to zero, I really have this triangle. In fact, if you think about it, these three inequalities are saying in the RZ plane, we look like this triangle. And now what's gonna happen? Well, because there's no theta, we're gonna spin around. So what's our shape? Our shape is kind of an interesting shape. Well, of course, you know, are there really any uninteresting shapes? It's like we took a cylinder, but then we scooped out a cone. So, okay, so our solid is a cylinder. Oops. <laughs> I can spell <laughs> sometimes. Okay, our solid is a cylinder. I, I'll get this right. Minus a cone. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's this cylinder where uh, we're going to go radius is 1, height is 2, and uh, say, okay, so how do you find the volume? Well, we'd find the volume of the cylinder, subtract the volume of the cone. So I say, ah, okay, so we're going to take volume of cylinder minus volume of the cone. Now, we're almost there. What is the cylinder? Well, the volume of the cylinder, pi a squared h. a is the radius. So the volume of the cylinder, this would be pi times 1 squared times 2. What's the volume of a cone? Well, it's 1 third pi a squared h. So it's very similar, 1 third pi a squared h. So essentially it's one third of what we had before. So we put that together and we say, oh, well this is becomes two pi and then we're gonna subtract uh, two thirds pi. And so our final answer, two pi subtract two thirds pi, you know, that's like six thirds pi and uh, subtract two thirds pi, which is four thirds Done, done, cool. And so, well, you know, a lot of it comes down to just sort of saying, all right, do we understand the, the, the shape that we see sort of showing up there? And if we understand it, then life is good. And if we don't, hopeless, hopeless. So that's why this class, the biggest challenge in, in multivariable calculus, and, and you'll hear this many times, is can you think geometrically? And I know you're like, ah, oh, I totally can think geometrically. I've lived in like in 3D my whole life. But it's trying to actually get into describing things and relationships between things. That's where the challenge comes. And it takes a little bit more than just living in 3D to work in 3D. And of course, that, that little bit more is practice, which is why we're here. All right, well, that was a, a good, fun picture problem. And, uh, well, let's uh, keep going. Number four. Suppose we have a vector u, which is marked here i plus 2j, and a vector v, which is 4i plus 2j. We want to find the projection of u onto v. So, in other words, this part right here. So that's the projection. 
uh, I'll go ahead and, and highlight that just so we're, we're unambiguous about what part we're talking about, that part right there. Okay, so how do we find it? Well, there's sort of two approaches. The first approach is remember the formula. And it's a fun formula. It's u dot v over v dot v times v. And so remember, the projection is actually a vector. So we have to come up with a vector. So u dot v is a number. So it's number over number is a number, which is how much do you scale? Then you have your vector v. And of course, if you look at this and you say, oh, well, you know, your v's, you have two v's upstairs and two v's downstairs, and so the v's cancel and you're left with u. But of course, the direction is in the direction of v. Okay, all right, well, that's one choice. And that's actually what we'll do. If you're like, ah, oh, darn it, I don't remember that. Uh, one thing you can do is you can say, oh, well, look, here's the vector u, it's this vector. And you say, well, there's this side here. Say, all right, well, I know the direction is in the direction of V. And I say, well, what's the length? Well, the length would be the magnitude of U cosine theta. This is the length we want, which is just to say, if I know the hypotenuse, I know the length of the adjacent side, it should be this. And our direction, well, that should be one over the magnitude of V times V. Here's our direction. And then you say, okay, well, multiply top and bottom by V. And you get magnitude of U, magnitude of V cosine theta over magnitude of V squared times V. Well, magnitude of V squared is V dot V. Magnitude, magnitude, magnitude U, magnitude V cosine theta is U dot V. All right, so anyways, that's our formula. Whoops, that's our formula, and we're sticking to it. All right, so uh, what, what do we have? Well, okay, this is everything's two-dimensional. So we can say, all right, so we'll say u is one, two, and v is four, two. Oh, yeah, there we go, four, two. So u dot v, so that's four, plus four. So we get four plus four is eight. V dot V, all right, that's 16 plus four. So four squared plus two squared. And uh, all right, that's times the vector V for I plus two J. Okay, so, okay, 16 uh, plus four is 20, as we already said. Eight over 20, you can pull out a four. So this becomes two over five times four i plus two j, which we can also write this as eight fifths i plus four fifths j. And all right, good, done, done. All right, now find the area of the triangle formed from the vectors u, v, and u minus v. What are those vectors? Well, we have u, we have v, so that's just copying from up the stairs. And what is u minus v? Well, notice if you took u minus v and added onto v, the result would be u. So u minus v is actually this vector here. You, you don't actually need to know that to answer the question, but that's what it means by the triangle. So we have this lovely triangle. Now, what's true? Well, if you look at this triangle, a triangle is half a parallelogram. You say, oh, okay, so the area is half the parallelogram uh, of the vectors u and v. Okay, all right. So, why do we bring that up? Well, we bring that up because how do we find areas of parallelograms? It turns out, this is a really cool fact, it's a, the magnitude of the cross product. Now, notice they gave us a hint. You may treat your u as a three-dimensional vector, and v as a three-dimensional vector. Now, up 
upstairs in the previous part, we said, look, they're, they're really two-dimensional vectors. We don't need to treat it as three-dimensional. So why would they tell us to treat it as a three-dimensional thing? Well, that suggests you need a three-dimensional tool. What's the 3D tool that, that for vectors? The, the 3D tool, the thing where you need 3D is cross product. So if anything says you really need 3D, cross product is probably involved. So we say, okay, so that's the idea. So say, okay, great. So once we find this cross product, we find the magnitude, multiply by half, life is good. Okay, so quickly, what's, well, or slowly, you know, there's no rush. We never feel pressured when we're doing exams, right? So U cross V, so we have our I, J, K. The first row is the three direction vectors. Then our next one is our one, two, zero, which is our vector U, and our four, two, zero, which is our, our vector uh, V. And uh, well, okay, so well, we have I times two times zero, zero, J times zero times uh, four, zero, K times 1 times 2 is 2K. So I'm doing diagonals in one direction. I'm doing diagonals in the other direction. 4 times 2 times K is 8K, but because I'm going in that direction, I subtract. 2 times 0 times I, 0. 0 times 1 times J is 0. So 2K subtract 8K is minus 6K. You say, oh, all right. So going back up here, so it's 1 half the magnitude of negative 6k. Well, magnitude of negative 6k is 6. That's pretty easy. So 1 half times 6 gives us 3. And uh, there we go. That's the answer. And uh, all right, wonderful. This is really a good test of the dot product and the cross product. We understand what they are and we understand how to use them. So projection, by the way, is a really good application of dot product. And uh, area is a nice application of cross product, though I suspect we'll use it again trying to find perpendicular things, which is cross products are really good at finding perpendicular things. Number five, a fighter plane which can shoot a laser beam straight ahead. Ooh, lasers, pew! Now, the reason they use lasers, by the way, is because it sort of makes a nice, straight, instantaneous line. And so you should think of the laser beam as being what? It's really the tangent line. So that's what's going on when they use laser beams. All right, so this, anyway, so this fire plane is traveling along this path, which is 5 minus t, 21 minus t squared, and a minus t cubed over 27. Okay, so part A. Find parametric equations for the tangent line at time t equals 3. And, well, our answers will have an a in it, and we know that because it says it will. All right. So, and remember, what is this tangent line? It's the laser. That's where the laser is pointing. So we're really finding the laser line. Okay, so <clears throat> what do you need? Well, whenever I think line, I need to have a direction, and a point. Those are my two things for lines. And my point, well, that's actually pretty simple. That's my r, and because we're at time t equals 3, that's r3. My direction, well, that comes from r prime of 3, because the direction is going to be the direction of the, the tangent line. It's capturing the sort of the instantaneous motion. How is, how is the, the fighter plane moving at time three. Okay, so uh, let's write down what r prime of t is for reference. So we take the derivative of each entry. So we'll have minus one, minus two t, and here the three comes down, and three does go into 27, so minus one ninth t squared. So our point which we plug in 3, is going to be 5 minus 3 is 2. 21 minus 
3 squared, it's 21 minus 9, is 12. And a, which we don't know, so we just write as a, 3 cubed is 27, so 27 over 27 makes minus 1. Our direction, which again we said is r prime of 3, so that's minus 1, minus 6, and 3 squared is 9, times minus 1 ninth makes minus 1. All right, so we've gotten our point and our direction, and so we put this together, and uh, just quickly checking, we want parametric equations for the tangent line, because there's a couple of different ways to write down our pieces. So what we have is we have our x, y, and our z, and then we're going to have two parts. Now, one part here, uh, I'll, I'll sort of put something in here. This is going to be our point. And then the other part is going to be our direction. All right. So, and then there's a t. And now we just read things off. So our point, 2, 12, a minus 1, then our, our direction is minus 1, minus 6, and minus 1. And so, uh, we've written a little bit cleaner, because who doesn't like it to be nice and clean? x equals 2 minus t, y equals 12 minus 6 t, and z equals a minus 1 minus t. And there we go. Now, part B, find the value of A so that the pilot can hit a target located at the origin if he shoots at time t equals 3. So remember the origin, aka 0, 0, 0. All right, so what do we have? Well, we have that 0, 0, 0 is a point on our line. And... Uh, Oh, I already see that there's a confusion here. I just want to... <laughs> Let me backtrack here for a second. And this is one of the things that gets dangerous about these types of problems. And I just want to point something out here. Um, this t is not that t. And so you maybe would replace it by the letter s. And so, just to be clear, because I don't want you to think, oh, the time t equals 3. Well, uh, really, you should just use a different symbol. And I should have done that from the beginning, and I apologize. This is, but that's all right. It's really a, mostly done just to stop confusion. So it depends on, you know, do you want to write your line in terms of a, a parameter t, or in terms of a new parameter and oftentimes it's better to use a new parameter. Okay, anyway, sorry, <laughs> back to uh, part B. And the reason I wanted to do that was I was like, ah, oh, but you're gonna say, but t equals three. Well, oh, but that's a different t. And, and so that's why I did that. Okay, so this is our, our line at t equals three. And so, well, we have to hit the origin. It's put on the line. So we need to have that 0 has to equal 2 minus s, 0 has to equal 12 minus 6s, and 0 has to equal a minus 1 minus s. Well, we, we saw the first equation tells us s equals 2. The second equation tells us that s equals 2 again. The third equation would tell us that a has to equal 1 plus s, but we know s equals 2 which says a has to equal 1 plus 2, which is 3. So our answer is a equals 3. And that's our right value for a. Now, of course, there's something to say, aha, it, it comes from that t. No, no, there's, there's a little bit more involved in it. It just happened to work out this way. Be careful with coincidences. Coincidences are really dangerous in math because you feel like, ah, there's a rule. No, it's just a coincidence, but that's all right. All right, anyways, focus, focus. We still have two more problems. Let's get this done. 
let's do great. Number six, compute the length of the curve, r of t equals e to the t sine t, the i component, e to the t cosine t in the j component, and e to the t in the k component, from time t equals zero to time t equals natural log of two. So, okay, what can we do? Well, <clears throat> you can say, what is length? Well, length, one way to find it is you integrate what? Well, you integrate your speed. So if you integrate your speed, then that's, uh, the integral of speed is distance, right? And that's, that's length. Well, how do you find speed? Well, speed is the magnitude of velocity. So that's the integral a to b of the absolute value of velocity. Now, if you just integrate just purely velocity, you'd find not the distance you traveled, but displacement, which is how far it is from where you started to where you ended, which is a slightly different thing. Well, what's velocity? Velocity is the derivative. So magnitude r prime of t dt. Okay, so there's our formula. So for this problem, we, we have r of t. If we find the magnitude of r prime, and then we integrate that, then life is good. So let's uh, do that. Okay, so we'll start with what is r prime of t. And we take the derivative of each term, e to the t sine t, we do the proctor, derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. So e to the t sine t plus e to the t cosine t. And then we have the second term, the first times, well, the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second, which puts a negative sign t. And finally, the derivative of e to the t is e to the t. Okay, so that's r prime. Now, what's the magnitude of r prime? So, it's going to take us a second here. It's the square root of, well, you have e to the t sine t plus e to the t cosine t squared e to the t cosine t subtract e to the t sine t squared and e to the t squared. All right, well, hmm, okay. Now the good news is this has e to the t, you can pull it out. Of course it's squared, so it's e to the 2t. Here, again, they both have e to the t, pull it out, becomes e to the 2t. Here's e to the 2t. Everything has that, we keep pulling, we keep pulling, it can keep pulling, so it pulls all the way out to e to the t. And that leaves us with our sine of t plus our cosine of t squared, our cosine of t minus our sine of t squared, and then one squared. All right, which is e to the t, and we expand. Sine squared plus two sine cosine plus cosine squared and cosine squared minus two sine cosine plus sine squared plus one. Whew. All right, now, if the trigonometry has taught us anything, it's just like things should simplify. All right, does anything simplify? Please. <laughs> things do simplify, all right. 2 sine cosine cancels. You've got 2 sine squared, so you have 2 cosine squared, and since sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, all those terms combine together to give you 2, and then plus one more. So that gives us a grand total of e to the t times square root of 3. And now we're like, whoa! Our very intimidating, scary thing becomes very simple. That often happens in these problems. If you see something intimidating, what will happen is at the right step, it will become simple. And uh, in our case, the right step is, well, we now need to integrate that. So our length is going to be the integral from 0 to natural log of 2, the e to the t times uh, square root of 3 
dt. Well, square root of 3 is a constant. And the integral of e to the t is e to the t. And now we plug it in. Well, so that's square root of 3, e to the log of 2. And here, be careful. Like, so often when you plug in 0, it's 0. You're just like, ah, it's 0. But, but no, no, because like, look, what is e to the 0? It's not 0. It's 1. So that's 2 minus 1. And so our final answer is square root of 3. Wow. What a nice answer. A great answer. The kind of answer we'd take home to meet our family. And uh, all right. Well, that was, that was the whole problem. Really, the, the hard challenge for this one is that you have to be careful and clean up your, your algebra. Make sure you get things canceling. And here's a good rule of thumb. If they ask you to find something, it's going to be something reasonable to happen. In other words, they're not going to ask you to do an integral which has lots of like terrible things inside a square root. Something nice should happen. And if something nice didn't happen, you should go back and, and check. Check your algebra, check your trig identities. Maybe just check to see if you can simplify some more. Because remember, your calculus professors like you. They want you to succeed. It's really true. They really want you to succeed. And so, you know, keep that in mind when you're doing these problems. All right, one last problem and then we'll be done. Our final problem is number seven. Knowing that the following two lines intersect, so we have 1 plus 2t, 4 minus t, minus 2 plus 3t, and 3s, 2 plus s, 2 minus s, Part A says, find the intersection point. Now, I want to point out something they did here, because this goes back to a silly thing I did a few problems ago, is they used different symbols here, t's and s's. They didn't, they could have both used t's, but then you would think, oh wait, are they the same t? And the answer is no. They have independent parameters. So, so that's why they chose a t here and an s here, just to emphasize, hey, you know, these are independent of each other. You can set the the two values. All right. Now, to be intersecting means that the x, the y, and the z all have to line up. So we say, all right, the x values have to be the same. So 1 plus 2t better equal 3s. The y values have to be the same. 4 minus t has to equal 2 plus s. And the z values, minus 2 plus 3t, has to equal 2 minus s. Well, you start simplifying, uh, maybe we'll say we'll re rearrange, 3s subtract 2t has to equal 1. Uh, here, we could say s plus t, because I can add t and then I subtract 2, better equal 2. And here, we can say s plus 3t, so I add s, here I'll add 2, better equal 4. All right, three equations, two unknowns. There's actually more equations than unknowns. And so it's not going to be so hard for us to find a solution. We, the thing, though, you have to be careful of is just verify at the end that, in fact, it does work for everything. Uh, I personally, I like these two because they both involve just an S. And so what I'll do is I'm going to rearrange the order and do a subtraction because I always like to cancel. And if I see a nice cancellation, well, that makes me happy. So here, I'll subtract. The s's cancel. 3t subtract t makes 2t. 4 subtract 2 makes, well, 2, which gets us down to t equals 1. And uh, so that's great. And now, once you know that t equals 1, you can actually plug in and get s plus 3 equals 4, and you get that s equals 1. Now, again, after I just rambled for a moment at the start of this problem, like s and t are independent, they don't have to be the same, it appears that they are both equal to 1. It will not always be the case that that's what happens. Sometimes you might have t equals 2 and s equals minus 3. You know, there could be all sorts of things. So be careful not to read too much into the fact that they're both 1. And by the way, what do we do? Well, we can check really quickly. 
So plug in 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 times 1 is 3. Yes. 4 minus 1 is 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. Yes. Minus 2 plus 3 is 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. Great. Which means that our point is 3, comma, 3, comma, 1. And that's what we get as the common point for both lines, their intersection point. Okay, part B. Find ABC so that the plane given by the equation AX plus BY plus CZ equals 32 contains the two lines. So we say, okay, we, we have to think about this a little bit. So we know a couple of things. We, we know a line, and uh, let's say this is our first line, and then we have our second line, and we have this point. And now our goal is to say, okay, what is the plane that somehow contains both these lines together? All right, well, what do we need to find a plane? We need a point, we have that, and we need a direction, in particular, the normal. All right, so how do we find the normal? Well, it's not given to us, but now we use the geometry to say, well, what do we have? We happen to have the two lines. Now lines, they have directions. So we can look at this line, let's say it's this first line here, and we can read off the direction by the coefficients of t. So this would be 2 minus 1, 3. We also have a second line. And again, we can read off the direction. And so look for the coefficients for uh, s. 3, 1, minus 1. So we have two directions in the plane, and they're not the same direction. They're not par parallel to each other. How do we know that? Well, if they were parallel, either they'd never intersect, or they'd intersect infinitely often. The fact that they only intersect once means that they, they can't be in the same direction. So, two vectors in the plane. How do we get the vector perpendicular? The answer is cross product. Cross product is built to make things perpendicular. So, now, well, we, we take the vectors, it doesn't matter which order we take them, and we can do their cross product. So our normal is 3, 1, minus 1, cross 2, minus 1, 3. Okay, so we set up i, j, k, 3, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1, 3. And uh, I like doing diagonals. So i times 1 times 3 gives 3i. j times minus 1 times 2, minus 2j. k times 3 times minus 1, minus 3k. Other diagonal, 2 times 1 times k minus 2k. Minus 1 times minus 1 times i is plus i, but because we're going the other direction, we're going to subtract minus 1 times i. 3 times 3 times j, 9j, but again we subtract. And uh, so we've put this all together and we'll end up with 2 for the i, minus 11 for the j, minus 5 for the k. Now, it's good to get in the habit of checking your work. And the, uh, the cross product has a great check. And the check is, quickly do the dot with your vectors you started with. 6 minus 11 plus 5 equals 0. It should. If it didn't, whoops, check, do it again. 4 plus 11 makes 15, minus 15 is 0. All right, so that is a normal. The question is, is it the normal? Because ABC is a normal vector. Okay, so we now know that we have the following. Our, our equation is 2x minus 11y minus 5z equals some constant d. Okay, that's the right equation for the plane. The question is, what's the right value for d? Plug in the point. 
So 2 times 3 minus 11 times 3 minus 5 times 1 should equal D. So this becomes 6 minus 33 minus 5. 6 uh, subtract 38 means D should be negative 32. So 2x minus 11y minus 5z equals negative 32. But look at the problem. What do you see? We're supposed to have ax plus by plus cz equals positive 32, not negative 32. And now our great aha, <laughs> we can scale as needed. In this case, we need to scale by a minus one. And so multiply both sides by minus one doesn't change the relationships. Any point that was on there before is still on there. So minus two X plus 11 Y plus five Z equals positive 32. So our final answer, A is negative two, B is 11, C is five. And we're done. Good, good. This one is a little tricky because they, they tell you this has to be 32. And well, okay, they're, they're testing a couple of things, but I think secretly they just want to make sure uh, it's easy to grade. Sometimes they write problems so that they're easy to grade. So be careful, be the right amount of careful. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed the, doing these problems. I know I always enjoy a good multivariable calculus exam because it's a wonderful chance to think about things geometrically and it's a uh, it's fun and the more you do it then the less uh how do i phrase this the more you do it the more fun problems become and the less like ah stressful they become and so keep working on the problems so that you can go into that exam and be like this is gonna be fun and i hope you have a great time all right later.